Thirty years ago, the Philadelphia Police Department carried out one of the greatest acts of police terror in U.S. history, right where I'm standing. The target was an organization called MOVE, a nearly all-black revolutionary group. On May 13, 1985, police set an example for all radicals nationwide by bombing the MOVE home, full of innocent men, women, and children, trapping them so that 11 people burned alive. I sat down with the only adult survivor of the move bombing, Ramona Africa, to hear her story, one of the hidden people's histories of life in American empire. The move organization was born in Philadelphia during a time of revolt. People of all nationalities were joining revolutionary groups and challenging the core structures of empire, war, racism, and inequality. In the tradition of the 1950s civil rights struggle, Armed self-defense against police and vigilante terror was also taken up by oppressed groups in the 60s and 70s. It was also a time of severe political repression, with wanton police brutality and COINTELPRO employed against black radicals. Led by founder John Africa, MOVE's philosophy was to challenge the abuse of all forms of life, including animals and nature and held regular non-violent protests confronting everything from Dow Chemical to the Ringling Brothers Circus. Under their philosophy of back-to-nature communalism, they liberally grew their hair and didn't conform to societal norms. Composting, caring for stray animals, and living without technology made them the target of ridicule and violence. They were called dirty hippies, cultists, and dangerous terrorists by the media. But despite the smear campaign, many were inspired by Move's message, commitment, and actions. Ramona Africa tells the story of how she joined the group. I start seeing the contradictions, the paradoxes, the lies, because at the time I met Move, I was a, a student my last year at Temple University. I had planned to go to law school. I had studied a pre-law curriculum. I had a bachelor's degree and an associate's degree. And that's where I was headed. <clears throat> and then uh, I met Move. Pam Africa, who was a supporter then, she started talking to me about going over to City Hall to the Move hearings that were going on and seeing for myself exactly what happens, what's going on in those courtrooms. And I did. I went. I was shocked and shaken. I could not believe what I was seeing in that courtroom. Nothing that I read in those textbooks that I was given to read at Temple University, nothing that those professors told me at Temple University, none of that was going on in that courtroom. I saw the blatant railroad, the obvious racism that was going on, the obvious frame up. On the other hand, I saw a group of revolutionaries and I saw them uncompromising, saw them representing themselves, cross-examining prosecution witnesses and exposing the lies and contradictions of these witnesses, I saw that they were not intimidated at all. At the Move 9 trial, Ramona was charged with contempt of court for clapping by Judge Lynn Abraham. She was sentenced to 60 days in jail. Well, I tell everybody, I owe her a thank you note because she sent me to the county jail for two months up close and personal with MOVE women. When I walked out of that prison after those two months, 
There was no turning back. Law school was out of the picture. I did not want to be like the judge, the prosecuting attorneys, or even the so-called defense attorneys. I wanted to be like MOVE. Ramona was witnessing the trial of members known as the MOVE Nine. The history of why they were being sent to jail gives the essence of the relationship between the police and MOVE. The political climate in Philadelphia was impacted by social change across the country. Education reform that brought affirmative action was met with fierce reaction from racists. It propelled figures like notorious crooked cop Frank Rizzo to positions of power. His claim to fame was leading an ultra-violent police riot against peaceful students in 1967, who were demonstrating in favor of black studies classes, where he ordered cops to, quote, get their black asses. As police commissioner, he proudly evoked a lynching while ordering raids on Black Panther offices, saying to a reporter, the Black Panthers should be strung up. His qualifications made him a star to the racist white sectors of Philadelphia. Openly campaigning on so-called white rights, he became mayor in 1971. One of his campaign slogans was vote white. The dual hatred of both African Americans and progressives made MOVE an obsession for the mayor and his ilk. MOVE members became a target of regular harassment and physical attacks by Rizzo's cops. Their abuse reached unspeakable heights. Between 1974 and 1975, three different MOVE women reported miscarriages after police beat them in their pregnant stomachs. In a police attack in 1976, Janina Africa's three-week-old child life was crushed by police. As Mamiya Abu-Jamal reported, non-move eyewitnesses saw police club Janine while she clutched her infant baby. In response to these vicious attacks, MOVE grew increasingly militant, upholding the philosophy of self-defense. But Rizzo and his gang weren't satisfied with random beatings. They didn't want an organized group of empowered black radicals that could criticize the police and fight back against their abuse to exist at all. For the good of the empire, all of COINTELPRO's hard work had to be honored. In 1977, escalating attacks led to members brandishing guns outside their home, declaring we will no longer be beaten and intimidated by police. 24-hour surveillance and positioning of attack squads and checkpoints surrounding the MOVE house began. But as the group remained defiant, the heavy-handed lockdown became an embarrassing 15-month quagmire for Rizzo. The police will be in there to drag them out by the backs of their necks. They're going to be taken by force if they resist. No question about that. Children or not. In March 1978, the police increased tensions by blockading food, water, and gas from the home and ordering journalists to leave the area. MOVE negotiated a deal with the city to move to a new location. But, as if Rizzo didn't want a peaceful resolution, he changed the terms of MOVE's deal with the city and obtained a rush warrant. On August 8, 1978, the attack began. Knowing there were many children inside, police started bulldozing the home, while the fire department shot water cannons. They were flanked by hundreds of police officers with assault rifles. On fire. Eventually, there was a barrage of gunfire. Philadelphia police say their shooting was set off by shots coming from the house. But several witnesses assert the first shots were directed at the house, including two reporters at the scene. Cops testified they unloaded their assault rifles into the move basement, where they could hear women and children crying. In the unhinged flurry of bullets, Officer James Ramp was shot and killed. And in the face of certain death, Move surrendered. When unarmed Delbert Africa came out, the Philadelphia police showed everything you need to know about their claims of upholding the law that day. He's hitting him, he's hitting him. Hitting him on the head. Hit, kicking him on the head. I have no idea. I just couldn't see. Shut up! Suffering a broken jaw and fractured eye socket, Delbert's beating became known as one of the worst incidents of police brutality ever recorded. 
The police then went on a rampage throughout the entire poor, mostly black community. Tell me, I was upstairs in my bedroom, yes, yes. trying to change my clothes. And here come all these people, all these cops. They're chasing me there with the nice things, hitting them all on the shoulders and stuff. It's, it's about three up there already hurt. See, they over there smiling and that there. See how they smiling? Yeah. You see how they smiling? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel that, you know, they, they uh, mad or what went down and they not uh, satisfied or just, you know, getting the mood. They want, like, all the people, like, not only this community, but the whole community, like, in, in the black community. It's the a, it's a hatred that they have and the mentality for, you know, black people. The move house was completely demolished the same day. Community protests denounced the police attack. Despite no evidence that the bullet came from the house, nine MOVE members were convicted for the shooting, all given 30 to 100 year prison sentences. Temple University professor who documented the incident, Lynn Washington, stated, the police department knows who killed Officer Ramp. It was another police officer. They have fairly substantial evidence that it was a mistake. I got this from a number of different sources in the police department. Protests eventually forced the indictment of the three officers for the infamous beating of Delbert Africa. Police hatred of MOVE peaked. And the head of the police union gave his thoughts on those who beat Delbert Africa. What they should have done is shot that goddamn bum and then there would have been no trouble today. All three cops were acquitted but MOVE didn't stop speaking out. The reign of arch-racist Rizzo ended in 1980, but deep-seated hatred of MOVE meant they would never leave the crosshairs of the boys in blue. Still, with no crimes to justify the removal of the MOVE family, the final confrontation started with a knock at the door. A plainclothes cop, I can't remember exactly who it was, cop, a man, walks up our front steps, knocks on the door. Me and my sister, Teresa Africa, who was killed in the bombing, we come out and we stand out there talking to this cop and him talking to us for at least an hour, at least. And when we were done, he just walked away, you know, he left. What we found out was that they had practiced, rehearsed, planned for over a year their attack on MOVE, their plan to exterminate MOVE, kill MOVE all. They thought they had a workable plan and they needed a reason to execute it. And there was nothing. So they ended up using that non-incident on April 29th, two weeks earlier, as their excuse to come at MOVE. On Mother's Day, 500 cops flooded into the neighborhood and barricaded the streets, readying for their one-sided war. People living in proximity to MOVE were told to evacuate for 24 hours. They tried to convince people that they came out there because neighbors had complaints about us. When did this government in this country ever care about black folks complaining about their neighbors? Since when? When did they ever care about black folks complaining about anything? Anything? They don't. They never did. That was not the issue. The issue was really and is still our unrelenting fight for our MOVE family members known as the MOVE 9. And they could not answer the questions that people were putting to them. And that is why they were feeling so much heat from MOVE, you know? And that is why they wanted to shut us up permanently in the words of Wilson Good, then mayor, first black mayor of Philadelphia, that he wanted a permanent end to MOVE. You were the only adult survivor of the MOVE bombing on that day, Ramona. Can you walk us through your experience? One thing that people should know is that on that day, on Mother's Day, Sunday morning, one of our supporters was going food shopping and she contacted us to ask if we needed her to get anything for us. 
And we said yes. So she came by to pick up the list and the money. Our children, some of our children, wanted to go with her. So they did. When she left, there was nothing really happening. When she came back, the police had put a wooden barricade at the top of Osage Avenue. It's a small one-way street. She pulls up and she's like, what's going on? You know, The police had us under surveillance for years before 85, for years. And so they were always parked up on the corner, you know, uh, at the other end of the street on Cobbs Creek Parkway. They were always parked out there uh, surveilling us. And so this one particular cop, black cop named George Draper, walks over to Gloria's car, looks in, he knows Gloria. I mean, she's been around for years, he knows her. He knows our kids, have seen them for years. He goes and moves the barricade to let Gloria drive back onto our street with our kids. Now, at this point, he knows what they're planning to do. That's why they had the barricade across the street, because they were setting up and moving cars off the street, this kind of thing move the barricade and let Gloria, he knew Gloria wasn't gonna stay at our house, but he knew our kids live there. Now, later on, Wilson Good says that he gave uh, the police commissioner and police officers um, orders that if they could remove our kids without a confrontation, you know, then they should remove the kids. They didn't. He let them right back on the street, right back into our house. Nothing happened all day. And uh, that night, that night, though, uh, Gregory Sambor, the police commissioner, he gets on the loudspeaker and says, attention move. This is America. You have to abide by the laws and, and, and something of American society and blah, 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 and said we had 15 minutes to come out. So we did not come out. And uh, the first mode of attack against us was the fire department. Four deluges. We were in the basement. The water was just pouring pouring down on us. I mean, pouring down on us. When flooding the house didn't work, police launched their next phase of attack. Then the police, um, they put smoke, tear gas, and it started spreading through the house. But um, in order to put the tear gas in our house, what they did was they used um, explosives. They claimed they wanted to um, put three-inch holes in the party walls on either side of our home to insert tear gas. When they finished using those explosives that were supposed to put three-inch holes in the wall, they had blown our whole front porch off. I mean, the whole front of our house was blown away, so it was wide open. So when that didn't drive us out of our home, they started shooting. According to their estimates, and you can take that with a grain of salt and scale it up, they shot over 10,000 rounds of bullets in on us within the first 90 minutes. They had to send to their arsenal for more bullets, for more bullets. It was only a handful of us in that house, six children in that house. When I say they shot over 10,000 rounds of bullets, 
They had their sidearms. They had M16 rifles. They had uh, shotguns. They had sniper rifles with silencers on them. They had uh, M60 automatic rifles. The police say the first shots were automatic gunfire from the move house. Yet the only automatic weapons ever found belonged to the police. Shockingly, they brought more than just M60 machine guns and enough ammo to kill a small city. They had bombs, too. Hovering in a police helicopter six feet over the move home, Lieutenant Frank Powell, with the official approval of Mayor Good and Police Commissioner Greg Samber, lit two pounds of C4 explosives and threw the bomb onto Move's roof. This 5.27 p.m., state police helicopter drops it. There is the explosion. The act of terror was long planned. An internal FBI letter confirms the agency personally delivered 30 blocks of C4 to the Philadelphia police for the assault. When you guys were in the basement, did you hear them announce anything before the bombing? No, I didn't. But like I said, it wouldn't have made a difference because we knew, we were very, very clear on the fact that they were not out there to arrest anybody. They had plenty of opportunity to arrest us if that was their aim. But it wasn't. It wasn't. Their aim was to kill, to exterminate, annihilate the MOVE organization. And that is why we didn't come out. We knew it. We knew it. For people who haven't been in combat or been around something like machine gun fire or bombs driving. Like me. Yeah. I mean, talk about what happened when that bomb dropped. Well, when the bomb, when they dropped that bomb, we heard it and like we knew it was something big because we could feel it in the house. But it never occurred. Well, I'll say it never occurred to me. I don't think it occurred to any of us that they had dropped a bomb on our house. And the fire started on the roof. So we're in the basement. We didn't know initially that a fire had started, but they knew it. They knew it and did nothing to put it out. When the fire erupted, Police Commissioner Samber and Fire Commissioner William Richmond both gave the order to, quote, let the fire burn. So after a while, you know, it was kind of like quiet, nothing was happening. But the smoke started getting thicker. And initially, we thought it was still the tear gas. But as it was getting thicker, we're like, no, nah, this is something else. And it started getting hot in there, you know, started getting hot. And then we could uh, hear the tree in the back of our house crackling. It had caught on fire. When we realized our house was on fire, contrary to what this system wants to convince people that we're suicidal and, you know, uh, made a decision to be burned alive. That's a lie. We tried to get our children, our animals, ourselves out of that blazing inferno. We hollered out, we're coming out, we're bringing the kids out. The kids were hollering, we're coming out, they're bringing us out. You know what the response was to that when we started trying to come out? They opened fire on us. They opened fire on us. Bullets were hitting all around us. We were forced back into the house at least twice, at least twice, which put us in a position of being burned alive 
or being shot to death, we made one last attempt to come out. And that is when Bertie and I got out. And not just my word, but Bertie's word. He could hear the gunshots all around us, you know. I heard them. I knew what was happening. What was happening was that the people waiting for them outside had a vendetta to honor. The team guarding the back exit of the burning house were the same cops indicted for the beating of Delbert Africa. Those who managed to escape the suffocating smoke and blazing inferno were met with a spray of police gunfire, forcing them back into the flames. The official move commission confirmed it was police gunfire that prevented the escape of the members through forensic pathologist Dr. Ali Hameli, whose team found shotgun pellets in Africa, a woman, and three children. Only two people survived the onslaught, Ramona and 13-year-old Bertie Africa. I got out first, and I'm helping Bertie out, and everybody was coming out behind us, which is the only way they could have bullet fragments in them, is to have gotten out of the basement and faced the gunfire coming from the cops who were shooting at us. Well, Bertie was the next one behind me, and uh, I saw Rhonda there. She was, you know, getting the kids out. And as far as I knew, when they took me into custody and Bertie into custody when they grabbed us, I was under the impression that everybody got out. The injuries they incurred were severe. I had burns on my arms, on my legs, and uh, not as big burns on my back. For four hours, they used fire as a weapon before they turned on the hoses they had so liberally used against MOVE in the initial attack, when there was no fire. The flames spread uncontrollably over three blocks engulfing over 60 homes. When the smoke cleared the ruins, 11 people lay dead. Five were children, all the result of a murderous scheme where top officials used military force to bomb their own civilians and ensured that they would burn alive. What accountability was there for any? None, absolutely none. Not one single official was ever charged with anything, with anything in the murder of my family members. Wrought with criminality, no official was ever punished for their role in the massacre. Sole adult survivor Ramona, however, was sent to jail for seven years for riot and conspiracy, refusing an offer to renounce move in exchange for a reduced sentence. Ramona talks about the hidden legacy of the bombing. It made national and international news. Uh, one thing is that it was so horrific, people, a lot of people don't even really want to deal with it. Another thing, another thing is if you really deal with who MOVE is, what we represent, and what happened to us, if you really deal with it, then you got to get up off your butt and do something. You can only come to the end conclusion that you got to put a stop to this kind of stuff. You got to work to make sure this never happens again. Nothing can justify this atrocity, which was planned and escalated by the highest officials against people criminalized for being different, for their ideas and for their courage. The Empire's soldiers in blue showed that their racist hate was so deep they could intentionally force one of the most painful deaths imaginable on innocent children. But over the decades, a movement has pushed back against brutal police tactics and impunity. And today, it's forcing these things into the spotlight like never before. Standing with that movement is part of changing a system that could ever allow such acts and honor those who believed in a future that valued all life.